Welcome to Lesson 13, Animation. Right away, we'll create a character animation and edit it by using the animation palette and graph display. We'll understand the concept of keyframes and interpolation styles and work with animation layers for maximum flexibility. We'll check out tools that automate animation for us, starting with Talk Designer, which automatically animates our characters' faces based on audio files, as well as Walk Designer, which generates walk and run cycles. All right, let's get ready to animate. Okay, everybody, let's get into animation. My favorite way to work as a 3D artist, what's great about Poser's animation tools is that they're very user-friendly and will accommodate you on day one as a beginner. In fact, we're going to create some animation together right now. And as you grow as an animation artist, the tools will further accommodate you the deeper you understand the art of animation itself. So it's basically for everybody from a beginner level all the way to even a professional level of use. Let's go ahead and before we dive into the animation tools, let's get you set up with the scene. I'm using Paul, the brand new Poser 11 male. You can find him under Figures, People, Paul's right here. And under Props, you can find Clothing, Paul folder. And I just applied a t-shirt and shorts. And it's casual day here at Poser, so no shoes. And I loaded hair for Paul from the hair library under his folder. Now, before jumping into animation tools, if we like, we can take a look at the pose presets under Poser, Universal Poses, and you've got G2 Animations. Now, you can try loading these on Paul. You'll get mixed results depending on the character. There's some fun stuff in here. And these were actually made for a G2 character, and they're not going to be perfect for Paul. Some frames will be a little wacky. But if you load Simon from your library, he is a G2 male, and these will be absolutely flawless with Simon or any other G2 character that you might have from Content Paradise. Now, if you also look at motion capture, there's some pretty cool stuff in here based off of actual motion capture from somebody wearing a motion capture suit. And again, the results will vary depending on the figure that you're working with. But they're really great resources to see how some more complex animation is put together and what the keyframes look like. So Go ahead and check out those on your own time. And speaking of motion capture, the universal file format for motion capture is called BVH. You can get yourself BVH motion capture files by purchasing them from a variety of places online. And you can even find free BVH motion capture files. And if you do, you can come up to File, Import, and BVH Motion. You can bring in your BVH files right there and have really awesome realistic motion for your characters. Now, another thing you can do is if you have Poser Pro, you can use the Microsoft Connect device to record your body's motion and create your own motion capture and apply it to your Poser characters. Pretty cool feature, but you have to have Poser Pro and Microsoft Connect in order to do that. So let's dive into the animation tools that we can do right here in Poser. And I'm going to go to come down. We've already worked with some animation. We know the time slider is here. We got our player controls. Just like a DVD player, we have our frame count. We want to access the little key icon here and click it, and you get your animation palette. This is where the majority of our animation editing is done and where all our keyframes will pop up right here once we start creating some animation. Now, let's just go over this really quick. You got your player controls, just like down below, same exact thing. You got frame rate, which you can adjust. You got your current time, and you've also got your frame count. So different ways of looking where you're at, whether it's by the frame or the time. Now you've also down here got your object list of everything that can be animated in Poser. You got Paul, you got your lights, all your cameras. Basically, just about everything can be animated inside Poser. And you can even turn on other things, such as if we go to the material room and we look at all the different channels of any material. If you click the little key, and turn it on. Well, now this material channel can be animated if we make changes to this color over different frames throughout our timeline. It'll automatically animate those changes for us. And we can do that for anything, as you can see. I'll go back to the pose room, back to our object list, and let's understand this structure a little bit here. And if you uncollapse Paul, you can see all his body parts. And we're already used to working with these body parts by clicking on them. And that list is the same as our drop down list here, as you can see. And if we click on, say, the chest, watch what happens. Just as if I clicked on Paul's actual chest in the scene, it automatically selects the chest in our parameters palette, and we see all the parameters. And so if we uncollapse the chest here, look, it's the same exact parameters. 
So when we make changes to Paul's body parts by clicking and dragging or adjusting the parameters, we're going to see those changes reflected right here. And we can see the changes as the keyframes pop up over time. So it's a very organized, pretty easy way to understand what's going on. Everything is all connected. Now let's go ahead and understand this further by jumping into some animation. Let's create some animation with Paul waving at us, okay? I'm going to go ahead and move my camera in, get a nice close view, and I'm going to grab R for rotate and just bring this arm down and relax that arm of his. And I'm going to bring this shoulder and arm up just a tad. And I'm also going to grab W for twist and twist that shoulder upper arm like so. And now that I twisted it, maybe I want to just level it back out a tad. Now I'm going to click on that forearm and I want to be a bit more precise so I don't have wacky angles and bends going on. And I'm going to use the bend parameter and just dial it back for that forearm and bring it up to a nice waving position. Howdy folks. There we go. Okay, great. And then I'm going to offset the hand. And this is the first frame of the wave coming in towards his head. Okay, that's it. So I'm going to collapse my chest object in my animation palette, bring up my view a little bit, and maybe even bring my camera in a little bit closer now. Make some room here. There we go. We have a 30 frame animation going on here. And that's perfect. Based off 30 frames per second, this is basically one second of animation. We can create the illusion of a longer animation by just making a simple looping animation. This is very handy to do. And so just keeping it one second, as long as frame one is the same as 30, it'll loop seamlessly and it'll look like he's just waving over and over and over for a minute straight, even though it's only a one second animation. So let's go to frame 15. We have the same time slider here that we have down below. And let's go ahead and create the second pose on frame 15 for our wave. And now we can just click and drag that arm down like he's waving. And I'm also going to grab the hand and move it down as well. And maybe even twist that hand a little bit so it looks pretty naturally. Whatever you think looks good for you. And I'll also modify the upper arm parts down just a bit to get some nice secondary motion there. Okay, great. Now if we drag our time slider back and forth, look, it's already created some frames for us automatically. That's what's great. It automatically does the keyframing for you when you make changes on a different frame from where you last left off. And we can see this darker green area. This is all the in-between frames that it automatically creates for us. And so the keyframes are what we created and the in-between frames are what Poser creates in between our keyframes. So now let's go to frame 30. And to have a seamless looping animation, we just need the same pose from frame one. Now we could do this by hand and eyeball it, but what's way easier is that we can just copy the frames from frame one from these body parts that we altered, the collar, shoulder, forearm, and hand. We can copy these from frame one and paste them to frame 30. Now you can just select any keyframe or you can click and drag to make a selection like so. I'm going to just click and drag a selection on just that row of those body parts for the, the very first frame. I'm going to release and then hold down the Alt key, then click and drag. And now I'm clicking and dragging a copy of all four frames, just like so. And now frame 30 is the same as frame one. And now if you press play, look at the magic happen. There you have it. Your very first character animation in Poser with a nice looping, hello everybody, wave from Paul. Now. The arm looks great, but the body's a bit rigid. It looks like he's frozen in place. What I like to do is look in the mirror when I'm doing any poses and look at what my body's doing. And I also do this with animation. And what I noticed is that my chest, neck, and head are slightly countering whatever my hand and arm is doing. So let's go ahead and create that counter motion so things look a little bit better. So on frame 15, when the hand is going away from the body, we want the body to go further away. So I'll start with the head with the rotate tool and move the head back that way, just a bit, not that much, just a nudge. And I'll do the same with the neck, just a nudge away from the hand and then the chest, just a tad. Okay, we can see those frames being created right here automatically. Now let's go back to frame one and do the opposite counter movement towards the hand. As the hand comes in, so does the head and neck go towards the hand. So just move each one just a very tiny nudge. Great. Now we want to do the same looping and 
we want to grab those three body parts and copy those frames as well. Hold down Alt, click and drag, and move those to frame 30. Great. Now press play. And look at how much more realistic that is. Pretty awesome. You can see by adding these nice overlapping details of different body parts, some more stronger than others, that's how animation is created. So this is a very simple level, but it's really the same process and formula moving forward to more complex animations. Now, there's something going on here. As you can see, skip frames is checked right here. The only way that Poser can play our preview animation in close to real time is to actually skip some of the frames. So even though we think it looks good here, we're not seeing really how good it is. In fact, if we turn skip frames off and press play again, it'll now play every single frame, but because it can't skip frames, the only way it can play is to go in sort of a slower motion like this. So it's much more fluid, but it's much more slower. So I'm going to press stop, go back to skip frames. So when you're working with animation and you want to really see what's going on with your motion, you have to do some low quality preview animations of your scene using the preview renderer. That way we can play every single frame without skipping frames and see exactly the actual frame rate that we're working with. And this is just the way every animator has to work and every program in the world is just like this. So it's just a part of animation life in 3D. So we can go up to animation, make movie, and it's just a quicker way instead of going through the render settings as you can see over here, straight to the movie settings. And on format, you want to change it to one of the pre-compressed movie formats. And I like the QuickTime MP4 option. And you make sure your render is on preview. We don't really care how good the render looks as far as the uh, lighting goes and quality of the pixels. It's more about the motion. And so just the lower the quality, the better, actually, just to get this done very quick. And the time span is already the full 30 frames. And I want to change the resolution from this web format 640 by 480 down to preview size. And that's our full preview we have set up here, this nice big dimension. The export options, I'll just leave them at the default. And you can press Make Movie, and that'll prompt you to save and name your file wherever you want. Now, I've already got this pre-cooked up for us to save us a minute. That only takes about a minute or so to render, but I still want to save us even a minute. And I'm going to go ahead and pull up my QuickTime file right here, and I'm just going to go ahead and play it. Now, because it's a looping animation in QuickTime, you can go to View and Activate Loop, and now it'll loop our 30 frames over and over and over. And if I press Play, there it is. Now we have a full frame rate of 30 frames per second. And we also are not skipping any frames. It's actually playing every single frame. And now look how much smoother it is compared to our preview in Poser. So this is just what you have to do. You make some changes to your animation. When you want to see what it looks like, you do a nice preview animation. And then you go back and make changes based on what you're seeing in your preview. All right. So things are looking pretty great. Let's go ahead and press pause here. And back to Poser. Now, let's go ahead and look at some of the other tools here in our animation palette. We know that our player controls can go from the first frame to the last frame, just like that. This plays an animation, this stops it. This guy here just toggles one frame at a time back and forward, just exactly like your DVD player does. So if you have something selected, this will skip and jump ahead from one keyframe to the next. And now it'll jump to the next keyframe. And we can just go back and forth. It's very handy to jump from keyframe to keyframe. Now we know that we can select a single keyframe. We can click and drag selecting multiple keyframes. We can actually select keyframes and move them around like so, modifying our animation. Just undo that a few times. Now if we create a selection, say like this, we can actually hit the plus symbol to create new keyframes based on whatever's going on right there. And we can also delete keyframes right there. Now, when we want to get real detailed into what's going on with our animation, we want to access the graph display by clicking on this red curve right here. Mine popped up on my secondary display monitor, so I'm going to bring this over here in view. And you can expand the view. And what's going on here is, unlike the animation palette where we can see multiple parameters, multiple body parts, pretty much all the keyframes for everything all at once, and we can modify just one keyframe for one parameter, or all the parameters for that keyframe because we collapsed that body part, or we can even select multiple body parts and all their parameter keyframes. Well, in the graph display, we can only look at the animation information 
for one parameter at a time. And right now we can see the body drop down list, so we can select any body part. And this is a little different. If I select, say, the forearm, it does not select it here. You have to select it from the body part drop down list and then select whatever parameter that you want to work with. So if I select the bend parameter, let me select something where we see what's going on more. So if I select the bend parameter, we can see the three keyframes for just that parameter. Well, there's an easier way to view the graph information for your parameter. Instead of just hitting this graph display, what I like to do is I can select on the forearm, uncollapse it here, and if you double click on the bend parameter or whatever parameter you want to see the graph display for, double click on either the name or anywhere in the timeline like so, and what you have is a graph display that pops up and it already has that body part and parameter selected based on where you double clicked in your animation palette. Let me just exit out of that first one. So it's a nice handy way to go right to exactly what you want to see. And now we can see the three keyframes for this parameter for bend just like we see them here. But we see exactly what Poser is doing to the motion with this nice graph display here. Now before we jump into what's really going on here, what we can do is see multiple graphs for multiple body parts at once. We could of course change the parameter right here and even the body part. But what's really cool is that by double clicking on another parameter, say the side to side, we can pop up multiple graph displays for multiple body parts and parameters at once. So now I'm looking at the side to side for the left arm as well as the bend parameter. So pretty cool feature there. I'm going to go ahead and shut this off. Get back to this one. And let's see what's going on here. We can click and drag and shift keyframes around like so. And notice it adjusts the graph based on where that keyframe is. I'll just undo that. If I click anywhere on the graph, it adds a keyframe, a little black dot. And now I can click and drag up and down, changing the value of that keyframe. And if I undo that, Let's go ahead and work with the keyframes that we already have built in. So if I click and drag on that frame 15 bend, you can see there, it's also modifying it right there in the scene above. So we can see exactly how it's not only affecting this keyframe, but in graph display, we can see how it's affecting the overall graph here. Now, if I want the body part to move differently uh, during the in-betweening, I can just adjust the graph like so by adding a keyframe and adjusting the graph as we can see there. And with that keyframe selected there, I can just delete it here. And I have the same jumping ahead by keyframes controls right here. So we can also adjust our view. We can minimize and maximize it like so and really get into the detail of the graph. And you can also narrow your view as well like so. Very useful for wanting to get really detailed information on what's going on with the graph, especially when you work with higher frame counts. Now we need to talk about something called interpolation. What that means is the style of motion here on the graph. It's a nice smooth curve. And what's happening here, when we looked at our preview motion, we saw that as the hand waved, it slowed down near a keyframe so that it's nice and smooth, and then slowly sped up as it made its way to the next keyframe, back and forth. And so what we can do is change this interpolation method to a different style of motion. We can do it here on a per parameter basis. We got our interpolation methods here. But I more often make those adjustments here because I can do it with multiple parameters or even multiple body parts at once. So let's experiment with this by selecting everything for all the animation we've done. And we got the same interpolation controls based on our selection in our animation palette. Now, if I change it from the green default spline method, this gives us the spline curves. The orange linear selection, if I click there, notice in the animation palette, it turns it to orange which signifies we're using a linear mode. And look what happened in our graph display. Instead of that smooth curve, it's this very mechanical type of motion, this linear curve now. In fact, it's just linear lines. It's no longer a curve. Let's go ahead and explore with a preview animation what this different type of motion is like. So you can go back up to animation, make movie, and see what that's like. I've already pre-cooked it up for us. Let me load up a linear type of animation. Here's my file right here. And I want you to pay close attention to the arm and hand. I press play. Do you see how rigid that looks there? See how it's just going back and forth. It's very rigid. It's like he's just 
abruptly shaking his hand back and forth. It's almost like a mechanical motion, sort of like a robot. Sometimes this is what you want. Sometimes humans do move very abruptly. But for the most part, we move very smooth, like the spline method of interpolation. So I want you to take note of that mechanical linear motion. And let's go back and look at our first spline type of motion. I've got that right here. And if we take a look now more closely, you see how much more smoother that is? It has a little bit of slowdown when it makes its way to the keyframe and then speeds back up gradually, making things nice and smooth there. So just be aware of this. Sometimes you're going to want that nice, smooth motion for the most part. And then sometimes you'll want the linear, more mechanical motion if you're working with objects or certain types of robotic characters or even abrupt changes in a human character. So that's basically your graph display. I'm going to close it out. And I'm going to undo to take things back to the nice, smooth interpolation. And that is really the basics of creating keyframe animation. You just add more keyframes and work with interpolation styles and changing them up on a per object or per parameter basis with more complex animations. So let's go ahead and jump to the Layers tab here. Layers is a pretty cool feature. We've been working on the base layer. If we select New, we just added a new layer. And if we go to the Keyframes tab, notice there's no keyframes on that new layer. They're back on our base layer. Anytime we create keyframes now on the layer above the base layer, those keyframes will override anything happening on the layer below it, on our base layer. Why would we want to do this? Well, for more than one reason. On a basic level, let's go back to our base layer. If we worked with a very complex animation, as you can see, you start populating keyframes very quickly. If this character was walking around and doing more things, you start accumulating dozens and even hundreds of keyframes with all your parameters and body parts. Well, if you want to clean your animation up or change it to something different, instead of cleaning up or making modifications to dozens of frames, if you work with a new layer, you can override hundreds of frames with just two simple keyframes and very cleanly edit your animation in just a few clicks. That's one reason for using layers. Another more common way of using layers is to organize your animation for the different body parts or different types of animation on different layers. We could have facial animation on one layer. And if we created animation on it, I could expand my, my total frame count. And let's say I had facial animation on layer one. I could shift it over and have it come later, but leave my body animation where it was on the base layer. Another reason we could work with layers is to have different types of animation for our body parts. So we could try different facial animation and we could turn those layers off in this toggle switch here and see what different types of animation looks like. So let's go ahead and understand this more thoroughly by creating some layered animation using some of the other animation features. So I'm just going to take our total frames back to 30 and just to get back to where we were. And I'm going to delete that new layer just to get right back to where we started. And I'm going to access a new feature called Talk Designer under Window, Talk Designer. Now, this is a pretty awesome tool. Talk Designer will automatically animate the face or lip syncing of your character based on any sound file that you load. So I created a sound clip where I'm saying, Welcome to Poser. So I'm going to go ahead and load that sound file right here. I've got my Welcome to Poser audio wave file. And now it pops up here. The next option is supplemental text. You could load a text file here or just type it in. Now, this is optional. You don't have to do the supplemental text. But if there's problems in your audio file, if you're talking too fast or if Poser has problems understanding what you're saying, if you're slurring your words, it'll help Poser be more accurate if you type some text in based on what's being said in your file. And you can also choose your language. I think I'm speaking English, so I'm just going to leave that. Next up is Visine Map. It's very critical that you have your correct Visine Map for your character. We're working with Paul, so we want to make sure Paul's Visine Map is loaded. And what that is doing, let me just turn off my animation palette. I'm going to select the Y tool to cleanly select Paul's head so that it doesn't modify my animation. And if I uncollapse the phonemes under Paul's head parameters, I'm going to go to the face camera real quick. And if I move the first one, mouth A, look at that. He's saying the letter A. If I move the P, he's now going P for P. 
So the phonemes are specifically built here so that you could make your character talk. And what the Visine map does is it recognizes the letters in the audio file and it basically starts triggering the phoneme mouth shapes to create animation for you. Pretty awesome stuff here. And we want to make sure that we have Paul selected for our figure and not the clothing. So it's very important. A lot of people make that mistake. And it's automatically telling us we have 34 frames of total animation time based off the length of that audio file. And here's where layers comes into effect. You could create this on your base layer, but why not keep things nice and organized and put it on a new layer? If we don't like the results, we could always delete it by getting rid of the layer or shift that layer around in time. And enunciation, just like you can become more flamboyant when you enunciate your words strongly or more weaker, you can set up your enunciation here. The default is pretty good for just normal conversation. And then you got some secondary motions here that are really great. It'll automatically blink for you, automatically create eye motion and head motion. Next up is emotional tweaks. If you crank one of these up, you can see that it will make Paul experience joy while talking or any other emotion that you want. I don't like to use these myself because these will often override your phoneme shapes. So I like to get the phonemes working good first, and then I can go back in and apply my expressions right here by hand in the parameters and do the same thing. You can see the joy parameter. And that's all it's referencing is what's already built into the character. So that's it. I'm going to go ahead and go back to the main camera. Okay, now we can go down and press apply. And it just takes about one second to work. So I can exit out of the talk designer. Let's access our animation palette and take a look at what's going on here. We can see we've got a new layer. It's named Lip Sync Paul. And if we go into keyframes, all the keyframes have been created. And look at that. Nice lip syncing going on there. The mouth is moving pretty nicely. Now, with lip syncing animation, if we press play, we'll hear the audio. Well, welcome to Poser. Well, welcome to. So we got a little bit of a problem there, as you can see. The skip frames is really becoming a problem. When you have real detailed motion like this on a frame by frame level, you really have to work with that animation make movie preview every single time you do anything like this. So let's go ahead and look at some samples that I've got pre cooked for you. You can make a movie of your own if you're following along. And here we go right here. So here's the very first sample I've got without any touch ups whatsoever. Welcome to Poser. Play it one more time. Welcome to Poser. Okay, you can see there's a little bit of a problem there. I'm going to scrub through. The vowels look great. However, the mouth does not close properly on the main consonants, the M in Welcome and the P in Poser. So we can quickly adjust our animation. Now understand that the talk designer is not going to give you stunning movie quality results. It does, however, give you an outstanding foundation, saving you hours of work. Could either use that. But if you want really great results, you're going to have to modify your animation a little bit and give it some tweaks. Now, if we go ahead and take a look at what's going on here, if I double click on, say, Paul's head, I want to get a graph display going on here. And now that we have a sound file loaded, we can see we've got the audio waveform right here in our graph display. And if we press play, we can try to follow along with the time slider to see where the M and the P is. Welcome, welcome to Pose. Welcome, welcome. So it's a little bit abrupt. We can try two other things. We can click and drag right on the time slider in the graph display. And right there, even though I couldn't hear it clearly, I heard it good enough to see that the M is around here in welcome and the P is right there. And we can sort of get the sense that it's going welcome, welcome to. Poser. Now there's a bit of an easier way to do this. You can also toggle through with your arrow keys and just hold down the left and right arrows and go back and forth. And if that's still not good enough, you can use an audio program to get the same waveform display. Now Poser has to calculate all the 3D information, so there's some lag here. And it's trying to give you some audio tools here. But if you go to just a dedicated audio tool, like I've got Audacity, this is a free program you can download. And if I bring that clip in, I got the same waveform. And if I press play, I can see more clearly what's going on. Welcome to Poser. Welcome to Poser. Yeah, so just like I suspected, just keeping it in Poser, the M is around here, the P is here, and still understanding that waveform display, 
I can now map that here and see that that same shape is here. It looks like frame 11 for what should be the M for welcome and about frame 21 for the P for poser. So if we just make those quick edits, we can get a much better animation. So we can go under head and I'll just close out the graph display now. And if we come down to, there we go, all the parameters that were created for us, we got the M mouth M shape here. And if I go to frame 11 right there, well, it looks like it applied it to frame 12. It's just not very strong. So let me bump into the face camera and see what's going on here. Now I can dial up the mouth M parameter much more stronger. It's got a maximum of one. So now what the problem is, is that the other mouth shapes involved on the same frame are not allowing the M to come through. So we can just zero those out one at a time. Let me move this over so you can see clearly. I'm going to zero out mouth A and see how much better it made that M shape come through. I'm going to zero out the TH th shape. And there we go. That's perfect. Just with those two modifications, the M looks much better on that frame. And let's go to frame 21. And it looks like P was not even generated here. Not sure why, but it doesn't matter. We can actually just go ahead and dial it up ourselves, grab the mouth P shape here and dial it all the way down. Now again, it's got some funny shapes going on because of the other phonemes being used. So let me just zero those out as well. Just zero out everything else except for P. And it looks like the O was the real problem there. And I can dial back the P so it's not so ridiculous. There we go. And now looks like 0.3 is all I needed. It was just being overridden by the other shapes. And that's another reason why I don't like to do the expressions because it will even give us more problems outside of Talk Designer. I'll do my expressions afterwards right here. So the P looks good. And let's go ahead and now because we created one keyframe there, we're going to have to make sure it's not P the whole time. And this is where keyframing gets really detailed. So a couple frames later, we're going to want to zero out the P. And a couple frames before, we're going to want to zero out the P as well. There we go. That way it just goes into the P and right out of the P like so. And it's not going to override all the other mouth shapes outside of that one frame that we wanted the P to work. So we're looking pretty great there. We can exit out and you can go ahead and do your own animation make movie preview. I've got one cooked up here for you. And if I play this one, it'll be a lot better. Welcome to Poser. Welcome to Poser. Welcome to Poser. So yeah, I definitely like that a lot better. I mean, hey, I'm not sure it's ready for uh, Paul to be a, a movie star for the next Pixar film, but pretty good considering we haven't really spent that much time on it. You can definitely get things to look very amazingly good. So I like to use these automated tools to help us as much as possible, saving us a lot of time so we can just concentrate on having some fun. So if we go back into our animation palette, and I'm gonna go ahead and collapse the uh, head there. Let's look at our layers. Now remember, we could shift this layer around. You know, if we make this a 90 frame animation, we can now make him talk later in the animation if we wanted to. So that's really the power of working with layers. We could also turn the playback off for that layer. Now, if we play the animation, there's no facial animation whatsoever. So we could do another pass at the talk designer and start stacking up multiple passes of settings using the talk designer to see which layer we like the best. So lots of different uses for the layers. I'm going to go ahead and delete that layer. And I'm also going to come up to animation and I'm just going to clear the sound. That way when we press play, we're not listening to welcome to poser. So we're back to where we started with just our waving animation. And I'm actually going to go ahead and just make a big selection and I'm going to delete all the animation. And all we have is just a default pose now. And there's really no animation going on. I want to jump into a new animation tool here. In fact, we can even restore the figure, Command or Control Shift F. And I'll restore my camera, Command or Control Shift H. And another amazing automation tool is the Walk Designer. If we go up to Window, walk designer right next to the talk designer this is a really awesome tool one of my favorite things to use in poser for animation now right away you got a little module here similar to talk designer hit the walk button 
and you see this automatically generated walk here. You can change your view from three quarter to side, front, and even top. Three quarter is, is the best. And what we can do, I'm going to expand this a little bit like so. We can start applying different walk styles to our character, and Poser will automatically generate them. It's pretty amazing. For instance, well, Paul is a Poser 11 character, so you can work with either G2 styles, Poser 10 characters. It's going to be best if you work with the Poser 11 styles for Paul. And let's have some fun with Paul. I'm going to go to the front view here. If I dial up, say, Poser 11 Sexy, it starts to work those hips, and we could actually make Paul have a sexy walk. Kind of funny stuff there. I'm just going to dial this back. I can hit the defaults to just reset everything. And there's lots of great stuff here. You can do a strong walk, like so. Hit the defaults again. You could do a run and crank this up like that. And if you come to the side, we can see it's a nice good run. So lots of different possibilities here. And I'm going to go ahead and hit the defaults. I just want to walk for now. And we can add some things like head bounce with the tweaks down here. You can see now the head is bouncing, maybe something a little subtle, about 13. And if I go from the front, Paul's wearing a shirt. We're going to want to make the arms swing out just a little bit, maybe something like that. And there we go. You can make the character stride. Some of these are better viewed from the different angles that you can change right here. You can make the character stride. You can see the legs are reaching farther out now. I think everything is going to be good with most of the defaults. Let me just make that back to zero. The only thing I did was really modify the arm out and the head bounce. Now, for the most part, this default character that it's working with here is going to be great for any character you have. Once in a while, you can find jerky little irregularities and motions. If that's the case after applying a walk, you can go to figure type. And depending on if you have a Mac or a Windows and where you assigned your poser content during install, I went with the default options for Windows, which is Documents. And under Poser 11 Content, you can go to Runtime, Libraries, Character. And just like a similar structure to our actual library, this is where all this stuff is. Under People, I go to Paul. And if I'm having irregularities and problems, I can change the figure type to my exact character. And I can select either the CR2 or CRZ file for Paul, or whatever character you have loaded. Now, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to say cancel because this default neutral character works pretty good for any character you have loaded. But if you have problems, you can change your figure type. And so that's it. We can press apply and we get some options here. You want to make sure you got your figure selected. And we'll start with walk in place, four cycles. And I'll let you read up on all these options, but it automatically for four cycles makes 120. And again, base layer or new animation layer. Let's keep this nice and organized and do a new animation layer so we can experiment with different walks. And I'll say OK. And this takes just a second or two to create the walk cycle. I'm going to exit out. And if I press play, look at this. This is absolutely amazing. It's got the head bounce in there. It brought the arms out. Do you know how long this would have took for anybody, even if you're a professional animator? This would have taken you at least a day possibly more to create a realistic walk like that. Now again, the skipping of the frames is a bit of an issue. We always need to export a quick preview of our animation to see what it really looks like. Let's go ahead and take a look. I've got this uh, pre-rendered out here, right here. And if we press play there, much more smoother. Look at that, pretty awesome, huh? And as you can see, we could have done any style of walk, a sexy walk, a power walk. Pretty awesome what the walk designer can do for you. This is a huge, huge time saver, let me tell you. So I'll just get back to Poser. Now let's get back into our animation palette here and look at what's going on with the layers for the walk we just created. We can see that layer was generated right here and it's working great. And because we created the walk on its own layer, we have a lot of control here. We can of course shift it along the timeline if we want. And we can also turn the layer off by unchecking playback right here. And if I press play, Nothing is happening. It's because the walk layer has been deactivated and Poser is only recognizing the base layer plus any other layers that would be activated on. So we can press stop. And it's a lot of control here because we can have multiple layers 
and we can experiment with different ideas by turning the layers on and off that we like. So let's go ahead and experiment with another idea with a different layer. But before we do that, I want to show you a problem that people run into when they first work with layers. Notice we're selected on the layer that is also deactivated. This can be a problem because if I go to my keyframes tab, I want you to see what can happen. If I try and move my camera, clicking and dragging, it's locked. Nothing can happen. If I move my character, it's also locked. Nothing can happen. Not only are the objects locked, but I'm creating keyframes on that deactivated layer and things are starting to get messy here. First thing I want to do right off the bat is hit undo twice and undo those keyframes that I unintentionally put on that layer. And the problem is that back in layers, this layer that's deactivated is selected as our current working layer. So we want to actually make sure we're on the layers that we want to work with that are active. And the only other layer that we have is the base layer, so we could click it right there and things will now be freed up to work with. Another way, if you're still on that layer there, is from any of the tabs, you can switch layers from this little drop down right here, and now we're on the base layer. And now, as you can see, we're free to move our character or our camera. And so just be aware of that because it can definitely happen. And you can get into trouble moving your camera around if animation is on for your camera and you're using different layers. So either turn animation for your camera off under properties or work with the posing camera or make sure you're on the base layer or be conscious of the layer you're working with when manipulating your camera if animation is on for the camera. So let's go ahead and get out of here. And we just created a walk cycle with Paul walking in place. Sometimes that's what you want to do, but very often if you have things going on in the scene such as buildings and props, you want a path for your character to walk around in the scene. We can do this very easily by coming up to Figure, Create Walk Path, and you can see it right here. If I zoom out, we got this nice vector Bezier path, and this is pretty awesome. We can control this path by just selecting the control points here and moving them around. And look at that. We have so much control over the shape of this path. And so we could manipulate this to wrap around objects or buildings, however we want Paul to walk or run. It's a little bit easier to control this and see what you're doing from the top camera. I'll access it right here. And I'm just going to zoom out a little bit. There we go. And I have a much better view of this path. And what we can do is, again, just click the control points like so. And I'm just going to do a simple little S curve, maybe zoom out a little bit more. There we go. And if I click anywhere on the path, notice I can create as many control points as I want. And then I can move those around for a very custom walk. If I hold down the Alt button and click, I can delete control points as well. So let me get back to the main camera. And I'm going to do something where he's coming from the back of the scene and ends up very close to the front of the camera. There we go. And let's go ahead and get back into the walk designer. And we got our settings from our previous walk. I'm going to hit the walk button to get the cycle going here in our preview. And I'm just going to crank up the P11 run since this is a Poser 11 character. Something close to 100%. And these different parameters that you can adjust. Well, you can see what they're doing from the different views that we have here. For instance, if I click on the side, I get a better view of the stride. Now you can see those legs are striding much more. And that'll make the character run faster or walk faster as well. So something, maybe just bump it up 5%. And I want the arms to swing in this direction, looking from the side. If you crank up the arm swing, that's what will happen. Just bump it up to maybe 30%. So it's a nice strong run. And if I view it from the front, I'm going to bring the arms out a little bit more as well. There we go. We have a nice forceful run. I'm going to go ahead and hit apply. And notice instead of walk in place, we can select the follow path option. And you can have multiple paths in the scene. This path object that we created, you can see it's called path one here. And we can recognize it from the drop down here. Now you can read about these other options in the Poser Reference Manual, but we'll leave those with the defaults. Looks like this is going to be a 79 frame animation. And again, create a new animation layer for this run cycle on the path. I'll hit OK. I'll exit out of Walk Designer, and let's just press play and see what it looks like. 
pretty awesome, following that path absolutely perfectly. Now it's looping through the animation, but notice that once it ends the path, the animation is frozen for a bit and then it resets. Let's look at why that's happening back in our animation palette. And to really see this, I need to extend the view to the full frame range of 120. Let's get back to layers. Our animation timeline was extended to 120 because of the previous walk cycle, and it was 120 frames. And so it's posing a bit of a problem here with our shorter layer for the run cycle. Now, I want to show you something here. If you look at this green bar at the bottom of your layer stack, this is your play range. Now we can shorten this by clicking the tab here. And we want to get it to shorter than or the same distance as the layer that we want to preview when we press play in Poser. So you can just put that close to the end of it there. And now if we press play, it should loop a lot better when viewing this from within Poser. There we go. So you have custom play ranges based on whatever layer that you want to see. Now let's go ahead and take a look at another few options with layers here. Because you have, like I said, a lot of control. We can turn this layer off and preview the walk again if we want. And what we can also do is move layers up and down based on our selected layer. You can see there. Now we would want to move things up and down because you can composite layers. You can see we're completely replacing, but you can also add and combine the different layers. You can have layers blend in the first few frames, however many you dictate, and also blend them out. So it's pretty awesome what you can do here. You should read up on the full layer controls and what you can do with them in the Poser Reference Manual. A lot of interesting things you can do because it's not just using one layer at a time. You can combine and composite your layers in interesting ways. So using just the run layer, in fact, let's name that layer from walk Paul 1. We can rename it right here to run Paul. There we go. We got our run layer activated. I'm going to go ahead and exit out of here. And we're going to want to do an animation preview to see what this looks like. So again, go up to animation, make movie. And I've already got one cooked up here for you. Right here, if I press play, there he is on that walk cycle, looking good along that path. And notice that his head is turning ahead of the corner. So you have that nice control there. Read up about these different options in your Poser Reference Manual for the walk designer and your layers as well. And you can see it's really easy to get some beautiful animation going in Poser. And on day one, even as a beginner, you can see just how easy it is to get going. So lots of fun to be had here. It's up to you what you do with the animation features inside Poser. You got your walk designer, your talk designer, and your custom keyframing possibilities. So go ahead, have fun with this stuff. Thanks so much for watching, everybody. I'll see you on the next video.